Welcome to OHSU Talk Shorts. I'm Jillian Beecham, Talks Fellow at OHSU. Today we'll be discussing toxic alcohols. You're working an ED shift when EMS arrives with a patient who they describe as intoxicated. You recognize the patient as a 46-year-old male who presents rather frequently to the ED with alcohol intoxication. He's accompanied by his worried-looking wife, who reports he's had slurred speech and mild agitation. I don't know how he got drunk, she says. I removed all of the alcohol from the house after he decided to get sober. You note the patient does indeed appear to be intoxicated, but no smell of alcoholic beverage on his breath. He has a small bluish stain on his shirt. What could the patient have ingested? You are concerned about the patient's history of alcohol abuse and realize that you need to consider the types of alcohols that the patient may have abused, including ethanol, ethylene glycol, methanol, and isopropyl alcohol. Keep in mind that alcoholics without access to traditional sources of alcohol may obtain ethanol in alternative products like perfumes, hand sanitizers, and cooking extracts. Let's start by taking a patient history. You ask the patient's wife if there is anything in the home the patient may have consumed in order to become intoxicated. Some things to ask about include sources of ethylene glycol, including antifreeze, and some brake fluids and de-icing fluids. Sources of methanol, including windshield washer fluid, solid cooking fuel for camping and chafing dishes, and carburetor cleaning fluids. And sources of isopropyl alcohol, such as hand sanitizer and rubbing alcohol. Patients with alcohol dependence or a history of alcohol abuse may be at risk of seeking alternative sources of alcohol if ethanol is not available. What is the appropriate workup for this patient? Obtaining an ethanol concentration can be helpful. Since ethanol, ethylene glycol, and methanol all share the same enzymes in their initial metabolism, ethanol can actually be protective by competitively occupying these enzymes and preventing the formation of toxic metabolites but only at a concentration over 100 milligrams per deciliter. Further, a negative ethanol concentration in a patient with apparent intoxication should prompt you to think of other causes of altered mental status. The differential diagnosis is broad and includes a number of CNS abnormalities, such as stroke, bleed, or CNS infections such as meningitis, but should also include the toxic alcohols. As we will discuss further, toxic alcohol ingestion can cause acidosis, increased serum osmolality, renal failure, and hypoglycemia. Evaluate the patient in whom you were concerned about possible toxic alcohol ingestion with a VBG, metabolic panel, and serum osmolality, in addition to serum ethanol concentration. Many hospital laboratories can perform a toxic alcohol screen, which may include ethylene glycol, methanol, and sometimes isopropyl alcohol concentrations. This should be obtained if available. Head CT may be considered in the patient with undifferentiated altered mental status. Initial steps in management should include assessment and management of the airway, fluid resuscitation in the hypotensive or dehydrated patient, antiemetics as needed, and supplemental thiamine, folate, and multivitamin, as is often considered in the patient with a history of alcohol abuse and likely poor nutritional status. One of the most important steps in managing the patient with potential toxic alcohol exposure is the use of antidotal therapy to prevent the formation of the toxic metabolites of ethylene glycol and methanol. As you know, Ethanol can outcompete ethylene glycol and methanol for the enzymes that convert these toxic alcohols to toxic metabolites. Indeed, ethanol can be used as an antidote in toxic alcohol ingestions, but is not a benign treatment modality, and the use of famepazole to block toxic alcohol metabolism is preferable. In addition, the thiamine and folate which you provided for your patient, given his chronic alcohol abuse and poor nutritional status, along with vitamin B6, can also, in theory, reduce toxic metabolite concentrations. Let's talk about each of the three common toxic alcohol exposures, starting with ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is metabolized to oxalic acid, which leads to renal failure 
and combines with calcium and precipitates as calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals in the renal tubules. Early after exposure, serum osmolality will be increased because ethylene glycol is an osmotically active substance. After several hours, the serum osmolality will decrease and the acidic metabolite, oxalic acid, will cause an acidosis, an increasing anion gap, and will eventually cause renal failure at around 24 to 72 hours post-ingestion. While fomepazole will block the formation of oxalic acid, if your patient presents with acidosis, an increased anion gap, or elevated creatinine, you should also discuss the patient with a nephrologist because toxicity has already developed. Serum ethylene glycol concentration over 20 mg per deciliter requires treatment with fomepazole, which is loaded at 15 mg per kilogram IV. The patient should be admitted for Q4 hour laboratory testing and Q12 hour fomepazole dosing until the serum ethylene glycol concentration is below 20 mg per deciliter. If the patient's serum ethanol concentration is well over 100 mg per deciliter, the patient may not initially need fomepazole therapy, as ethanol will prevent the formation of toxic metabolites. For example, if the patient's ethanol concentration is 200 mg per deciliter, assuming conservatively that the patient will metabolize at most 25 mg per deciliter per hour, the patient will remain blocked by ethanol for the next four hours. Assuming the ethanol concentration would be at or below 100 mg per deciliter at that point, fomepazole therapy should then be initiated. Methanol is metabolized to formic acid, a toxic metabolite that causes retinal and optic nerve toxicity. Just like with ethylene glycol toxicity, serum osmolality will be elevated early after ingestion and will decrease over time while the patient develops a worsening anion gap metabolic acidosis. As with ethylene glycol, treat the patient with fomepazole unless you are sure their ethanol concentration is high enough to provide adequate blockade of metabolism. Certain indications for dialysis in the methanol intoxicated patient include severe acidosis with a pH less than 7.15 and or anion gap greater than 24 despite aggressive supportive care with fluid resuscitation, serum methanol concentration over 70 mg per deciliter, and severe effects such as coma, seizures, or vision loss. Given a very long half-life and the risk of permanent vision loss, many toxicologists have a lower threshold to consult a nephrologist, including a methanol concentration over 50 mg per deciliter or the presence of acidosis despite fluid resuscitation. Isopropyl alcohol is metabolized by the same enzymes to acetone, which is a ketone but not an acid. Unlike ethylene glycol and methanol toxicity, patients develop ketosis without an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Intoxication with negative ethanol concentration and a ketosis in the absence of acidosis is suggestive of isopropyl alcohol ingestion. This should be differentiated from patients with chronic malnutrition due to alcohol abuse and who may present with a starvation or alcoholic ketoacidosis who do present with an elevated anion gap. Isopropyl alcohol is very intoxicating. Remember, with a known isolated isopropyl alcohol ingestion, you don't need to block metabolism with fomepazole, as there is no toxic metabolite. In fact, blocking with fomepazole will simply prolong intoxication. Isopropyl alcohol ingestion patients can develop a hemorrhagic gastritis due to local irritant effects and may present with hematemesis. IV fluids, antiemetics, consideration of a PPI, and observation until the patient has obtained clinical sobriety is warranted. Let's summarize. Ethanol, ethylene glycol, methanol, and isopropyl alcohol are all intoxicating alcohols. The differential diagnosis for the intoxicated patient is broad and should include consideration for the toxic alcohols. Toxicity includes renal failure with ethylene glycol, vision loss with methanol toxicity,
and hemorrhagic gastritis with isopropyl alcohol toxicity. Evaluate with VBG, metabolic panel, and alcohol concentrations, and consider treatment with Fomepazole to block metabolism of ethylene glycol and methanol to their toxic metabolites. If you have high suspicion for toxic alcohol ingestion, Fomepazole is indicated while alcohol concentrations are pending or for patients with ethylene glycol or methanol concentrations above 20 mg per deciliter and an ethanol concentration at or below 100 mg per deciliter. For patients with severe toxicity, such as refractory acidosis, renal failure, or vision loss, consult nephrology for dialysis. Thanks for tuning in to OHSU Talk Shorts. We'll see you next time.